Okay, so in the past two videos, we went over a lot in terms of oogenesis. It's a very complex process. And so in this next flowchart, uh, the final flowchart on oogenesis, which we'll entitle oogenesis 3, uh, remember, as we go through this, keep in mind that figure 46.11 is very, very useful. What we're going to be doing is basically summarizing everything we just talked about very quickly and just finishing up the idea of oogenesis, what a truly mature egg cell really is. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves how we got to the secondary oocyte, which we sort of left off with in the previous video, and we had the corpus luteum. Don't forget that either. So we started off with what? Embryonically, we started off with those things called primordial germ cells, and those were diploid. Okay, those developed further. How did they develop further, and what did they develop further into? That developed further into oogonium. Okay, so those oogonium are also diploid, and this development, both of these, were embryonic in nature. Then later on, we developed the oogonium further into the primary oocytes. So a primary oocyte is going to be something that is still diploid, but this is what's actually going to be fully present at birth. All of the primary oocytes that a female will have for the rest of her life are present at birth um, after this embryonic development of the primordial germ cell into the oogonium, then finally primary oocyte. That primary oocyte will then have uh, its home, let's say, would be within a follicle structure. And within the follicle structure, remember, there are about um, 6 to 12 of these that develop every month, and only one of them is going to grow more than the others, and that one that grows more than the others will house the eventual secondary oocyte. So we'll have the secondary oocyte be released from that larger follicle that's growing better rate and is overall just a better follicle than all the others that matured or tried to mature every month. And remember, we also are going to throw away and sort of leave off that polar body. Where did that polar body come from? It's sort of a side note. Why? Because of the unequal cytokinesis that resulted in a secondary oocyte. Remember, this was as a result of meiosis 1 being completed. If meiosis 1 was completed, the secondary oocyte, therefore, is haploid. And so now, what we have to remember is that the secondary oocyte was arrested it stopped its metaphase, its meiosis actually, at metaphase 2. Completed meiosis 1, but stopped at metaphase 2. Why? What is going to happen? Well, there's going to be two major consequences that happen every single month, every single time this process of oogenesis happens within a female. Here are the two scenarios. Either you can have fertilization. So let's say if sperm fertilizes, FERT for fertilizes, the secondary oocyte, what are the consequences? What happens? What is the purpose? The fertilization process is going to then urge the completion of meiosis II. Meiosis II will be completed. We don't need to know the specifics as to how it's completed, but we just need to know right now that once sperm fertilizes secondary oocyte, it finishes metaphase II and finishes the overall process of meiosis, uh, meiosis II specifically. And in addition, what's going to happen now is we finally have a completely mature egg. This is technically the stage, if you have a sperm fertilized a secondary oocyte, upon that moment, that's when you have a completely mature egg because it's completely finished meiosis II, and thus it's fully, fully mature in its absolute most mature state, if you can call it anything most mature, let's say. And then also, this mature egg will have the sperm head within it. The sperm head contains something very important. It contains half the genes that make you you and I. It contains the father's side of the genome. And that sperm head is going to sort of fuse. And so we're going to have the mature egg and the sperm head fuse their respective genomes if fertilization does happen. And then we would state that oogenesis is absolutely and 110% complete in its fullest form if all of these events occur. Now, this is actually not the most common scenario of what's occurring. What usually occurs is no fertilization in most females. So what's going to happen is the following. If no sperm fertilization, okay, um, what's going to be the end result? We're going to have the secondary oocyte. It is looking for a sperm cell, can't find a sperm cell. What is it going to do? It's going to disintegrate. It is within the fallopian tubes, within the oviducts. And if it does not meet up with a sperm cell eventually, it will disintegrate. It will go away. What about that structure that was left over? Remember when the secondary oocyte left 
and was ejected from the ovary, it left a structure called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum also, because there's no pregnancy to maintain, there's no fertilization that happened, the corpus luteum itself also goes away. The corpus luteum dies a well. And this is going to be referred to as a process known as a luteo for corpus luteum, luteolysis. The breakdown of a corpus luteum will happen if there's no sperm fertilization. In addition, a process, a cycle, is going to complete itself, and that is going to be menstruation. Menstruation will occur. This is something we'll talk about in a lot more detail coming up in the next couple of flowcharts, this process of why this is occurring, how it's occurring, and the overall ramifications of this occurrence. And then finally, because there's no sperm fertilization, you actually will start all of this process again. You're going to have the start of a new cycle, a new cycle of oogenesis and a new cycle of menstruation, therefore. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we move forward. This completes our look at oogenesis. I highly suggest looking at figure 46.11. Keep in mind that all of these steps seem sort of repetitive or they seem sort of counterintuitive, but what you have to remember is that the female body in the oogenesis process is trying to make the most perfect, the most successful, and the most capable secondary oocyte of all of the possible oocytes that can be made. That's why we have 6 to 12, and we have one that wins out of all of them. That's why we have one secondary oocyte and not two secondary oocytes. We have one that's a large secondary oocyte, etc. There's a large energy investment that the female makes to make sure that its side of the genome is successful because its side of the genome is going to have to house the overall whole organism uh, within the uterus, as we'll see. That covers oogenesis. We'll now begin looking at the actual menstruation process in greater detail.